Chapter fifty nine of David Copperfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tyg Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter fifty nine. Return. I landed in London on a wintry autumn evening. It was dark and raining, and I saw more fog and mud in a minute than I had seen in a year. I walked from the Custom House to the Monument before I found a coach, and although the very house-fronts looking on the swollen gutters were like old friends to me, I could not but admit that they were very dingy friends. I have often remarked, I suppose everybody has, that one's going away from a familiar place would seem to be the signal for change in it. As I looked out of the coach window and observed that an old house on Fish Hill Street, which had stood untouched by painter, carpenter, or bricklayer for a century, had been pulled down in my absence, and that a neighbouring street of time-honoured insalubrity and inconvenience was being drained and widened, I half expected to find St. Paul's Cathedral looking older. For some changes in the fortunes of my friends I was prepared. My aunt had long been re-established at Dover, and Traddles had begun to get into some little practice at the bar in the very first term after my departure. He had chambers in Gray's Inn now, and had told me, in his last letters, that he was not without hopes of being soon united to the dearest girl in the world. They expected me home before Christmas, but had no idea of my returning so soon. I had purposely misled them that I might have the pleasure of taking them by surprise. And yet I was perverse enough to feel a chill of disappointment in receiving no welcome, and rattling alone and silent through the misty streets. The well-known shops, however, with their cheerful lights, did something for me, and when I alighted at the door of the Gray's Inn coffee-house I had recovered my spirits. It recalled at first that so different time when I had put up at the Golden Cross, and reminded me of the changes that had come to pass since then. But that was natural. "'Do you know where Mr. Traddles lives in the inn?' I asked the waiter as I warmed myself by the coffee-room fire. "'Auburn Court, sir. Number two. "'Mr. Traddles has a rising reputation among the lawyers, I believe,' said I. "'Well, sir,' returned the waiter, "'probably he has, sir, but I'm not aware of it myself.' This waiter, who was middle-aged and spare, looked for help to a waiter of more authority, a stout, potential old man with a double chin, in black breeches and stockings, who came out of a place like a churchwarden's pew at the end of the coffee-room, where he kept company with a cash-box, a directory, a law-list, and other books and papers. "'Mr. Traddles,' said the spare waiter, "'number two in the court.' The potential waiter waved him away and turned gravely to me. "'I was inquiring, said I, whether Mr. Traddles, at number two in the court, has not a rising reputation among the lawyers.' "'Never heard his name,' said the waiter, in a rich, husky voice. I felt quite apologetic for Traddles. "'He's a young man, sure,' said the portentous waiter, fixing his eyes severely on me. "'How long has he been in the inn?' "'Not above three years,' said I. The waiter, who I supposed had lived in his churchwarden's pew for forty years, could not pursue such an insignificant subject. He asked me what I would have for dinner. I felt I was in England again, and really was quite cast down on Traddles' account. There seemed to be no hope for him. I meekly ordered a bit of fish and steak, and stood before the fire musing on his obscurity. As I followed the chief waiter with my eyes, I could not help thinking that the garden in which he had gradually blown to be the flower he was, was an arduous place to rise in. It had such a prescriptive, stiff-necked, long-established, solemn, elderly air. I glanced about the room, which had had its sanded floor sanded, no doubt, in exactly the same manner when the chief waiter was a boy, if ever he was a boy, which appeared improbable, and at the shining tables where I saw myself reflected, in unruffled depths of old mahogany, and at the lamps without a flaw in their trimming or cleaning, and at the comfortable green curtains with their pure brass rods snugly enclosing the boxes, and at the two large coal fires brightly burning, and at the rows of decanters, burly as if with the consciousness of pipes and expensive old port wine below, and both England and the law appeared to me to be very difficult indeed to be taken by storm. 
I went up to my bedroom to change my wet clothes, and the vast extent of that old wainscoted apartment, which was over the archway leading to the inn, I remember, and the sedate immensity of the four-post bed, and the indomitable gravity of the chest of drawers, all seemed to unite in sternly frowning on the fortunes of Traddles, or on any such daring youth. I came down again to my dinner, and even the slow comfort of the meal and the orderly silence of the place, which was bare of guests, the long vacation not yet being over, were eloquent on the audacity of Traddles and his small hopes of a livelihood for twenty years to come. I had seen nothing like this since I went away, and it quite dashed my hopes for my friend. The chief waiter had had enough of me. He came near me no more, but devoted himself to an old gentleman in long gaiters, to meet whom a pint of special port seemed to come out of the cellar of its own accord, for he gave no order. The second waiter informed me in a whisper that this old gentleman was a retired conveyancer living in the square, and worth a mint of money, which it was expected he would leave to his laundress's daughter. Likewise it was rumoured that he had a service of plate in a bureau, all tarnished with lying by, though more than one spoon and a fork had never yet been beheld in his chambers by mortal vision. By this time I quite gave Traddles up for lost, and settled in my own mind that there was no hope for him. Being very anxious to see the dear old fellow nevertheless, I dispatched my dinner in a manner not at all calculated to raise me in the opinion of the chief waiter, and hurried out by the back way. Number two in the court was soon reached, and an inscription on the doorpost informing me that Mr. Traddles occupied a set of chambers on the top story, I ascended the staircase. A crazy old staircase I found it to be, feebly lighted on each landing by a club-headed little oil wick, dying away in a little dungeon of dirty glass. In the course of my stumbling upstairs, I fancied I heard a pleasant sound of laughter, and not the laughter of an attorney or barrister, or attorney's clerk or barrister's clerk, but of two or three merry girls. Happening, however, as I stopped to listen, to put my foot in a hole where the Honourable Society of Gray's Inn had left a plank deficient, I fell down with some noise, and when I recovered my footing all was silent. Groping my way more carefully for the rest of the journey, my heart beat high when I found the outer door which had Mr. Traddles painted on it open. I knocked. A considerable scuffling within ensued, but nothing else. I therefore knocked again. A small, sharp-looking lad, half-footboy and half-clerk, who was very much out of breath, but who looked at me as if he defied me to prove it legally, presented himself. "'Is Mr. Traddles within?' I said. "'Yes, sir, but he's engaged.' "'I want to see him.' After a moment's survey of me, the sharp-looking lad decided to let me in, and opening the door wider for that purpose, admitted me first into a little closet of a hall, and next into a little sitting-room, where I came into the presence of my old friend, also out of breath, seated at a table, and bending over papers. "'Good God!' cried Traddles, looking up. "'It's Copperfield!' and rushed into my arms, where I held him tight. "'All well, my dear Traddles. "'All well, my dear, dear Copperfield, and nothing but good news.' "'We cried with pleasure, both of us. "'My dear fellow,' said Traddles, rumpling his hair in his excitement, "'which was a most unnecessary operation. "'My dearest Copperfield, my long-lost and most welcome friend, "'how glad I am to see you! How brown you are!' "'How glad I am! Upon my life and honour I never was so rejoiced, my beloved Copperfield. Never!' I was equally at a loss to express my emotions. I was quite unable to speak at first. "'My dear fellow,' said Traddles, "'and grown so famous! My glorious Copperfield! Good gracious me! When did you come here? Where have you come from? What have you been doing?' Never pausing for an answer to anything he said, Traddles, who had clapped me into an easy chair by the fire, all this time impetuously stirred the fire with one hand, and pulled at my neckerchief with the other, under some wild illusion that it was a great coat. Without putting down the poker, he now hugged me again, and I hugged him. And both laughing and both wiping our eyes, we both sat down and shook hands across the hearth. "'To think,' said Traddles, "'that you should have been so nearly coming home as you must have been, my dear old boy, and not at the ceremony.' Well, "'What ceremony, my dear Traddles?' "'Good gracious me!' cried Traddles, opening his eyes in his old way. Well, "'Didn't you get my last letter?' "'Certainly not, if it referred to any ceremony.' 
Why, my dear Copperfield, said Traddles, sticking his hair upright with both hands, and then putting his hands on his knees, I am married. Married? I cried joyfully. Lord bless me, yes, said Traddles, by the Reverend Horace to Sophie down in Devonshire. Why, my dear old boy, she's behind the window curtain. Look here. To my amazement, the dearest girl in the world came at that instant, laughing and blushing, from her place of concealment, and a more cheerful, amiable, honest, happy, bright-looking bride, I believe, as I could not help saying on the spot, the world never saw. I kissed her as an old acquaintance should, and wished her joy with all my might of heart. "'Dear me,' said Traddles, "'what a delightful reunion this is! "'You are so extremely brown, my dear Copperfield. "'God bless my soul, how happy I am!' "'And so am I,' said I. "'And I am sure I am,' said the blushing and laughing Sophie. "'We are all as happy as possible,' said Traddles. "'Even the girls are happy. "'Dear me, I declare I forgot them.' "'Forgot,' said I. "'The girls,' said Traddles, "'Sophie's sisters, they are staying with us. "'They have come to have a peep at London. "'The fact is, when... "'Was it you that tumbled upstairs, Copperfield?' "'It was,' said I, laughing. "'Well, then, when you tumbled upstairs,' said Traddles, "'I was romping with the girls. "'In point of fact, we were playing at puss in the corner. "'But as that wouldn't do in Westminster Hall, "'and as it wouldn't look quite professional "'if they were seen by a client, they decamped.' "'And they are now listening, I have no doubt,' said Traddles, glancing at the door of another room. "'I am sorry,' said I, laughing afresh, "'to have occasioned such a dispersion.' "'Upon my word,' rejoined Traddles, greatly delighted, "'if you had seen them running away and running back again after you had knocked, "'to pick up the combs they had dropped out of their hair, "'and going on in the maddest manner, you wouldn't have said so. "'My love, will you fetch the girls?' Sophie tripped away, and we heard her received in the adjoining room with a peal of laughter. "'Really musical, isn't it, my dear Copperfield?' said Traddles. "'It's very agreeable to hear. It quite lights up these old rooms. To an unfortunate bachelor of a fellow who has lived alone all his life, you know, it's positively delicious. It's charming. Poor things, they have had a great loss in Sophie, who, I do assure you, Copperfield, is, and ever was, the dearest girl, and it gratifies me beyond expression to find them in such good spirits. The society of girls is a very delightful thing, Copperfield. It's not professional, but it's very delightful. Observing that he slightly faltered, and comprehending that in the goodness of his heart he was fearful of giving me some pain by what he had said, I expressed my concurrence with a heartiness that evidently relieved and pleased him greatly. "'But then,' said Traddles, "'our domestic arrangements are, to say the truth, quite unprofessional altogether, my dear Copperfield. Even Sophie's being here is unprofessional. And we have no other place of abode. We have to put to sea in a cockboat, but we are quite prepared to rough it.' "'and Sophie's an extraordinary manager. "'You'll be surprised how these girls are stowed away. "'I am sure I hardly know how it's done.' "'Are many of the young ladies with you?' I inquired. "'The eldest, the beauty, is here,' said Traddles in a low, confidential voice. "'Caroline. And Sarah's here, the one I mentioned to you "'as having something the matter with her spine, you know. "'Immensely better. And the two youngest that Sophie educated are with us. "'And Louisa's here.' "'Indeed!' cried I. Yes, said Traddles. Now the whole set, I mean the chambers, is only three rooms, but Sophie arranges for the girls in the most wonderful way, and they sleep as comfortably as possible. Three in that room, said Traddles, pointing, two in that. I could not help glancing round in search of the accommodation remaining for Mr. and Mrs. Traddles. Traddles understood me. Well, said Traddles, we are prepared to rough it, as I said just now, and we did improvise a bed last week upon the floor here. But there's a little room on the roof, a very nice room when you're up there, which Sophie prepared herself to surprise me, and that's our room at present. It's a capital little gypsy sort of a place. There's quite a view from it. And you are happily married at last, my dear Traddles, said I. How rejoiced I am! "'Thank you, my dear Copperfield,' said Traddles, as we shook hands once more. "'Yes, I am as happy as it is possible to be.' "'There's your old friend, you see,' said Traddles, nodding triumphantly at the flower-pot and stand. "'And there's the table with the marble top. "'All the other furniture is plain and serviceable, you perceive. "'And as to plate, Lord bless you, we haven't so much as a teaspoon.' "'All to be earned,' said I cheerfully. "'Exactly so,' 
replied Traddles, all to be earned. Of course, we have something in the shape of teaspoons, because we stir our tea, but they are Britannia metal. The silver will be the brighter when it comes, said I. The very thing we say, cried Traddles. You see, my dear Copperfield, falling again into the low confidential tone, after I had delivered my argument on DOE, Dems, Jipes versus Wigzeal, which did me great service with the profession, I went down into Devonshire and had some serious conversation in private with the Reverend Horace. I dwelt upon the fact that Sophie, who I do assure you, Copperfield, is the dearest girl. I am certain she is said I. She is indeed, rejoined Traddles, but I am afraid I am wandering from the subject. Did I mention the Reverend Horace? You said that you dwelt upon the fact. True, upon the fact that Sophie and I had been engaged for a long period, and that Sophie, with the permission of her parents, was more than content to take me, in short, said Traddles, with his old frank smile, on our present Britannia metal footing. Very well. I then proposed to the Reverend Horace, who was a most excellent clergyman, Copperfield, and ought to be a bishop, or at least ought to have enough to live upon without pinching himself, that if I could turn the corner, say, of two hundred and fifty pounds, in one year, and could see my way pretty clearly to that, or something better next year, and could plainly furnish a little place like this besides, then, and in that case, Sophie and I should be united. I took the liberty of representing that we had been patient a good many years, and that the circumstance of Sophie's being extraordinarily useful at home ought not to operate with her affectionate parents against her establishment in life, don't you see? Certainly it ought not, said I. I'm glad you think so, Copperfield, rejoined Traddles, because without any imputation on the Reverend Horace, I do think parents and brothers and so forth are sometimes rather selfish in such cases. Well, I also pointed out that my most earnest desire was to be useful to the family, and that if I got on in the world and anything should happen to him, I refer to the Reverend Horace, I understand, said I, or to Mrs. Crueller, it would be the utmost gratification of my wishes to be a parent to the girls. He replied in a most admirable manner, exceedingly flattering to my feelings, and undertook to obtain the consent of Mrs. Crueller to this arrangement. They had a dreadful time of it with her. It mounted from her legs to her chest, and then into her head. What mounted? I asked. Her grief, replied Traddles, with a serious look. Her feelings generally. As I mentioned on a former occasion, she is a very superior woman, but has lost the use of her limbs. Whatever occurs to harass her usually settles in her legs, but on this occasion it mounted to the chest and then to the head, and, in short, pervaded the whole system in a most alarming manner. However, they brought her through it by unremitting and affectionate attention, and we were married yesterday six weeks. You have no idea what a monster I felt, Copperfield, when I saw the whole family crying and fainting away in every direction. Mrs. Crueller couldn't see me before we left, couldn't forgive me then for depriving her of her child, but she is a good creature, and she has done so since. I had a delightful letter from her only this morning. And in short, my dear friend, said I, you feel as blessed as you deserve to feel. Oh, that's your partiality, laughed Traddles. Uh, but indeed, I am in the most enviable state. I work hard and read the law insatiably. I get up at five every morning and don't mind it at all. I hide the girls in the daytime and make merry with them in the evening. And I assure you I am quite sorry that they are going home on Tuesday, which is the day before the first day of Michaelmas term. But here, said Traddles, breaking off his confidence and speaking aloud, are the girls, Mr. Copperfield. Miss Crueller, Miss Sarah, Miss Louisa, Margaret, and Lucy. They were a perfect nest of roses. They looked so wholesome and fresh. They were all pretty, and Miss Caroline was very handsome. But there was a loving, cheerful, fireside quality in Sophie's bright looks, which was better than that, and which assured me that my friend had chosen well. We all sat round the fire, while the sharp boy, who I now divined had lost his breath in putting the papers out, cleared them away again, and produced tea-things. After that he retired for the night, shutting the outer door upon us with a bang. Mrs. Traddles, with perfect pleasure and composure beaming from her household eyes, having made the tea, then quietly made a toast as she sat in the corner by the fire. She had seen Agnes, she told me, while she was toasting. Tom had taken her down to Kent for a wedding trip, and there she had seen my aunt too. 
and both my aunt and Agnes were well, and they all talked of meeting me. Tom had never had me out of his thoughts, she really believed, all the time I had been away. Tom was the authority for everything. Tom was evidently the idol of her life, never to be shaken on his pedestal by any commotion, always to be believed in, and done homage to with the whole faith of her heart, come what might. The deference which both she and Traddles showed towards the beauty pleased me very much. I don't know that I thought it very reasonable, but I thought it very delightful, and essentially a part of their character. If Traddles ever for an instant missed the teaspoons that were still to be won, I have no doubt it was when he handed the beauty her tea. If his sweet-tempered wife could have got up any self-assertion against any one, I am satisfied it could only have been because she was the beauty's sister. A few slight indications of a rather petted and capricious manner, which I observed in the beauty, were manifestly considered by Traddles and his wife as her birthright and natural endowment. If she had been born a queen bee, and they labouring bees, they could not have been more satisfied of that. But their self-forgetfulness charmed me. Their pride in these girls, and their submission of themselves to all their whims, was the pleasantest little testimony to their own worth I could have desired to see. If Traddles were addressed as a darling once in the course of that evening, and be sought to bring something here, or carry something there, or to take something up, or put something down, or find something, or fetch something, he was so addressed by one or other of his sisters-in-law at least twelve times in an hour. Neither could they do anything without Sophie. Somebody's hair fell down, and nobody but Sophie could put it up. Somebody forgot how a particular tune went, and nobody but Sophie could hum that tune right. Somebody wanted to recall the name of a place in Devonshire, and only Sophie knew it. Something was wanted to be written home, and Sophie alone could be trusted to write before breakfast in the morning. Somebody broke down in a piece of knitting, and no one but Sophie was able to put the defaulter in the right direction. They were entire mistresses of the place, and Sophie and Traddles waited on them. How many children Sophie could have taken care of in her time I can't imagine, but she seemed to be famous for knowing every sort of song that ever was addressed to a child in the English tongue, and she sang dozens to order with the clearest little voice in the world, one after another, every sister issuing directions for a different tune, and the beauty generally striking in last, so that I was quite fascinated. The best of all was that, in the midst of their exactions, all the sisters had a great tenderness and respect both for Sophie and Traddles. I am sure when I took my leave, and Traddles was coming out to walk with me to the coffee-house, I thought I had never seen an obstinate head of hair, or any other head of hair, rolling about in such a shower of kisses. Altogether it was a scene I could not help dwelling on with pleasure, for a long time after I had got back and wished Traddles good-night. If I had beheld a thousand roses blowing in a top set of chambers, in that withered Gray's Inn, they could not have brightened it half so much. The idea of those Devonshire girls among the dry law stationers and the attorney's offices, and of the tea and toast and children's songs in that grim atmosphere of pounce and parchment, red tape, dusty wafers, ink jars, brief and draught paper, law reports, writs, declarations, and bills of costs, seemed almost as pleasantly fanciful as if I had dreamed that the Sultan's famous family had been admitted on the roll of attorneys, and had brought the talking bird, the singing tree, and the golden water into Gray's Inn Hall. Somehow I found that I had taken leave of Traddles for the night, and had come back to the coffee-house with a great change in my despondency about him. I began to think he would get on, in spite of all the many orders of chief waiters in England. Drawing a chair before one of the coffee-room fires to think about him at my leisure, I gradually fell from the consideration of his happiness to tracing prospects in the live coals, and to thinking, as they broke and changed, of the principal vicissitudes and separations that had marked my life. I had not seen a coal-fire since I had left England three years ago, though many a wood-fire I had watched as it crumbled into hoary ashes, and mingled with the feathery heap upon the hearth, which had not inaptly figured to me in my despondency my own dead hopes. I could think of the past now gravely, but not bitterly, and could contemplate the future in a brave spirit. Home, in its best sense, was for me no more. She, in whom I might have inspired a dearer love, I had taught to be my sister, 
She would marry, and would have new claimants on her tenderness, and in doing it would never know the love for her that had grown up in my heart. It was right that I should pay for the forfeit of my headlong passion. What I reaped I had sown. I was thinking, and had I truly disciplined my heart to this, and could I resolutely bear it, and calmly hold the place in her home which she had calmly held in mine, when I found my eyes resting on a countenance which might have arisen out of the fire in its association with my early remembrances. Little Mr. Chillip, the doctor, to whose good offices I was indebted in the very first chapter of this history, sat reading a newspaper in the shadow of an opposite corner. He was tolerably stricken in years by this time, but, being a mild, meek, calm little man, had worn so easily that I thought he looked at that moment just as he might have looked when he sat in our parlour waiting for me to be born. Mr. Chillip had left Blunderstone six or seven years ago, and I had never seen him since. He sat placidly perusing the paper, with his little head on one side and a glass of warm sherry nagus at his elbow. He was so extremely conciliatory in his manner that he seemed to apologise to the very newspaper for taking the liberty of reading it. I walked up to where he was sitting and said, "'How do you do, Mr. Chillip?' He was greatly fluttered by this unexpected address from a stranger, and replied in his slow way, "'I thank you, sir. You are very good. Thank you, sir. I hope you are well.' "'You don't remember me,' said I. "'Well, sir.' returned Mr. Chillip, smiling very meekly and shaking his head as he surveyed me. "'I have a kind of impression that something in your countenance is familiar to me, sir, but I couldn't lay my hand on your name, really.' "'And yet you knew it long before I knew it myself,' I returned. "'Did I indeed, sir?' said Mr. Chillip. "'Is it possible that I had the honour, sir, of officiating when—' "'Yes,' said I. "'Dear me,' cried Mr. Chillip. "'But no doubt you were a good deal changed since then, sir.' "'Probably,' said I. "'Well, sir,' observed Mr. Chillip, "'I hope you'll excuse me if I am compelled to ask the favour of your name.' On telling him my name, he was really moved. He quite shook hands with me, which was a violent proceeding for him, his usual course being to slide a tepid little fish-slice an inch or two in advance of his hip, and evince the greatest discomposure when anybody grappled with it. Even now he put his hand in his coat-pocket as soon as he could disengage it, and seemed relieved when he had got it safe back. "'Oh, dear me, sir,' said Mr. Chillip, surveying me with his head on one side. "'And it's Mr. Copperfield, is it? Well, sir, I think I should have known you, if I had taken the liberty of looking more closely at you. There's a strong resemblance between you and your poor father, sir.' "'I never had the happiness of seeing my father,' I observed. "'Very true, sir.' said Mr. Chillip, in a soothing tone. Very much to be deplored it was, on all accounts. We are not ignorant, sir, said Mr. Chillip, slowly shaking his little head again, down in our part of the country, of your fame. There must be great excitement here, sir, said Mr. Chillip, tapping himself on the forehead with his forefinger. You must find it a trying occupation, sir. What is your part of the country now? I asked, seating myself near him. "'I am established within a few miles of Bury St. Edmund, sir,' said Mr. Chillip. "'Mrs. Chillip, coming into a little property in that neighbourhood, under her father's will, I bought a practice down there, in which you will be glad to hear I am doing well. My daughter is growing quite a tall lass now, sir,' said Mr. Chillip, giving his little head another little shake. "'Her mother let down two tucks in her frocks only last week. Mm, such is time, you see, sir.' As the little man put his now empty glass to his lips when he made this reflection, I proposed to him to have it refilled, and would keep him company with another. "'Well, sir,' he returned in his slow way, "'it's more than I am accustomed to, but I can't deny myself the pleasure of your conversation. It seems but yesterday that I had the honour of attending you in the measles. You came through them charmingly, sir.' I acknowledged this compliment, and ordered the nagus, which was soon produced. Uh, "'Quite an uncommon dissipation,' said Mr. Chillip, stirring it. "'But I can't resist so extraordinary an occasion. "'You have no family, sir?' "'I shook my head. "'I was aware that you sustained a bereavement, sir, some time ago,' said Mr. Chillip. "'I heard it from your father-in-law's sister. "'Very decided character there, sir.' "'Why, yes,' said I, "'decided enough. "'Where did you see her, Mr. Chillip?' 
are you not aware, sir, returned Mr. Chillip, with his placidest smile, that your father-in-law is again a neighbour of mine? No, said I. He is indeed, sir, said Mr. Chillip, married to a young lady of that part with a very good little property, poor thing. And this action of the brain now, sir, don't you find it fatigue you? said Mr. Chillip, looking at me like an admiring robin. I waived that question and returned to the Murdstones. I was aware of his being married again. Do you attend the family? I asked. Not regularly. I have been called in, he replied. Strong phrenological developments of the organ of firmness in Mr. Murdstone and his sister, sir. I replied with such an expressive look that Mr. Chillip was emboldened by that and the Nagus together to give his head several short shakes, and thoughtfully exclaim, Ah, dear me, we remember old times, Mr. Copperfield. And the brother and sister are pursuing their old course, are they? said I. Well, sir, replied Mr. Chillip, a medical man, being so much in families, ought to have neither eyes nor ears for anything but his profession. Still, I must say, they are very severe, sir, both as to this life and the next. The next will be regulated without much reference to them, I dare say, I returned. What are they doing as to this? Mr. Chillip shook his head, stirred his nagus, and sipped it. She was a charming woman, sir, he observed in a plaintive manner. The present Mrs. Murdstone? A charming woman indeed, sir, said Mr. Chillip, as amiable, I am sure, as it was possible to be. Mrs. Chillip's opinion is that her spirit has been entirely broken since her marriage, and that she is all but melancholy mad. And the ladies, observed Mr. Chillip timorously, are great observers, sir. I suppose she was to be subdued and broken to their detestable mould, heaven help her, said I, and she has been. Well, sir, there were violent quarrels at first, I assure you, said Mr. Chillip, but she is quite a shadow now. Would it be considered forward, if I was to say to you, sir, in confidence, that since the sister came to help, the brother and sister between them have nearly reduced her to a state of imbecility? I told him I could easily believe it. I have no hesitation in saying, said Mr. Chillip, fortifying himself with another sip of Nagus, between you and me, sir, that her mother died of it, or that tyranny, gloom, and worry have made Mrs. Murdstone nearly imbecile. She was a lively young woman, sir, before marriage, and her gloom and austerity destroyed her. They go about with her now, more like her keepers than her husband and sister-in-law. That was Mrs. Chillip's remark to me only last week, and I assure you, sir, the ladies are great observers. Mrs. Chillip herself is a great observer. Does he gloomily profess to be, I am ashamed to use the word in such association, religious still, I inquired. You anticipate, sir, said Mr. Chillip, his eyelids getting quite red with the unwonted stimulus in which he was indulging. One of Mrs. Chillip's most impressive remarks. Mrs. Chillip, he proceeded in the calmest and slowest manner, quite electrified me by pointing out that Mr. Murdstone sets up an image of himself and calls it the divine nature. You might have knocked me down on the flat of my back, sir, with the feather of a pen, I assure you, when Mrs. Chillip said so. The ladies are great observers, sir. Intuitively, said I, to his extreme delight. I am very happy to receive such support in my opinion, sir, he rejoined. It is not often that I venture to give a non-medical opinion, I assure you. Mr. Murdstone delivers public addresses sometimes, and it is said, in short, sir, it is said by Mrs. Chillip, that the darker tyrant he has lately been, the more ferocious is his doctrine. I believe Mrs. Chillip to be perfectly right, said I. Mrs. Chillip goes so far as to say, pursue the meekest of little men, much encouraged, that what such people miscall their religion is a vent for their bad humours and arrogance. And do you know, I must say, sir, he continued, mildly laying his head on one side, that I don't find authority for Mr. and Miss Murdstone in the New Testament. I never found it either, said I. In the meantime, sir, said Mr. Chillip, they are much disliked, and as they are very free in consigning everybody who dislikes them to perdition, we really have a good deal of perdition going on in our neighbourhood. However, as Mrs. Chillip says, sir, they undergo a continual punishment, for they are turned inward to feed upon their own hearts, and their own hearts are very bad feeding. Now, sir, about that brain of yours, if you'll excuse my returning to it. 
Don't you expose it to a good deal of excitement, sir? I found it not difficult, in the excitement of Mr. Chillip's own brain, under his potations of magus, to divert his attention from this topic to his own affairs, on which, for the next half-hour, he was quite loquacious, giving me to understand, among other pieces of information, that he was then at the Gray's Inn coffee-house to lay his professional evidence before a commission of lunacy, touching the state of mind of a patient who had become deranged from excessive drinking. "'And I assure you, sir,' he said, "'I am extremely nervous on such occasions. "'I could not support being what is called bullied, sir. "'It would quite unman me. "'Do you know, it was some time before I recovered the conduct of that alarming lady "'on the night of your birth, Mr. Copperfield?' "'I told him that I was going down to my aunt, the dragon of that night, early in the morning, "'and that she was one of the most tender-hearted and excellent of women, "'as he would know full well if he knew her better.' The mere notion of the possibility of his ever seeing her again appeared to terrify him. He replied with a small, pale smile, uh, "'Is she so? Indeed, sir, really?' and almost immediately called for a candle and went to bed, as if he were not quite safe anywhere else. He did not actually stagger under the nagus, but I think his placid little pulse must have made two or three more beats in a minute than it had done since the great night of my aunt's disappointment." when she struck at him with her bonnet. Thoroughly tired, I went to bed, too, at midnight, passed the next day on the Dover coach, burst safe and sound into my aunt's old parlour while she was at tea, she wore spectacles now, and was received by her and Mr. Dick and dear old Peggotty, who acted as housekeeper, with open arms and tears of joy. My aunt was mightily amused when we began to talk composedly by my account of my meeting with Mr. Chillip and of his holding her in such dread remembrance, and both she and Peggotty had a great deal to say about my poor mother's second husband, and that murdering woman of a sister, on whom I think no pain or penalty would have induced my aunt to bestow any Christian or proper name, or any other designation. End of chapter 59《Chapter sixty of David Copperfield》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tig Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter sixty. Agnes. My aunt and I, when we were left alone, talked far into the night how the emigrants never wrote home otherwise than cheerfully and hopefully, how Mr. Micawber had actually remitted diverse small sums of money, on account of those pecuniary liabilities in reference to which he had been so businesslike as between man and man, how Janet, returning to my aunt's service when she came back to Dover, had finally carried out her renunciation of mankind by entering into wedlock with a thriving tavern-keeper, and how my aunt had finally set her seal on the same great principle by aiding and abetting the bride, and crowning the marriage ceremony with her presence, were among our topics already more or less familiar to me through the letters I had had. Mr. Dick, as usual, was not forgotten. My aunt informed me how he incessantly occupied himself in copying everything he could lay his hands on, and kept King Charles I at a respectful distance by that semblance of employment. How it was one of the main joys and rewards of her life that he was free and happy, instead of pining in monotonous restraint, and how, as a novel general conclusion, nobody but she could ever fully know what he was. "'And when, Trot,' said my aunt, patting the back of my hand, as we sat in our old way before the fire, "'when are you going over to Canterbury?' "'I shall get a horse and ride over tomorrow morning, aunt, unless you will go with me.' "'No,' said my aunt, in her short, abrupt way. "'I mean to stay where I am.' "'Then I should ride,' I said. "'I could not have come through Canterbury to-day without stopping, if I had been coming to any one but her.' She was pleased, but answered, "'Tut, Trot, my old bones would have kept till to-morrow, and softly patted my hand again as I sat looking thoughtfully at the fire. Thoughtfully, for I could not be here once more, and so near Agnes, without the revival of those regrets with which I had so long been occupied, softened regrets they might be, teaching me what I had failed to learn when my younger life was all before me, but not the less regrets. Oh, Trot, I seemed to hear my aunt say once more, and I understood her better now, Blind, blind, blind. 
We both kept silence for some minutes. When I raised my eyes I found that she was steadily observant of me. Perhaps she had followed the current of my mind, for it seemed to me an easy one to track now, willful as it had been once. "'You will find her father a white-haired old man,' said my aunt, "'though a better man in all other respects, a reclaimed man. Neither will you find him measuring all human interests and joys and sorrows with his one poor little inch rule now.' "'Trust me, child, such things must shrink very much before they can be measured off in that way.' "'Indeed they must,' said I. "'You will find her,' pursued my aunt, "'as good, as beautiful, as earnest, as disinterested as she has always been. "'If I knew higher praise, Trot, I would bestow it on her.' "'There was no higher praise for her, no higher reproach for me. "'Oh, how had I strayed so far away!' "'If she trains the young girls whom she has about her to be like herself,' said my aunt, earnest even to the filling of her eyes with tears, the heaven knows her life will be well employed. Useful and happy, as she said that day. How could she be otherwise than useful and happy?' "'Has Agnes Annie?' I was thinking aloud, rather than speaking. "'Well, eh? Annie what?' said my aunt sharply. "'Annie lover,' said I. "'A score!' cried my aunt, with a kind of indignant pride. She might have married twenty times, my dear, since you have been gone. No doubt, said I, no doubt. But has she any lover who is worthy of her? Agnes could care for no other. My aunt sat musing for a little while, with her chin upon her hand. Slowly raising her eyes to mine, she said, I suspect she has an attachment, Trot. A prosperous one, said I. Trot, returned my aunt gravely. I can't say. I have no right to tell you even so much. She has never confided it to me, but I suspect it. She looked so attentively and anxiously at me, I even saw her tremble, that I felt now, more than ever, that she had followed my late thoughts. I summoned all the resolutions I had made in all those many days and nights, and all those many conflicts of my heart. If it should be so, I began, and I hope it is. "'I don't know that it is,' said my aunt curtly. "'You must not be ruled by my suspicions. "'You must keep them secret. "'They are very slight, perhaps. "'I have no right to speak.' "'If it should be so,' I repeated, "'Agnes will tell me at her own good time. "'The sister to whom I have confided so much, aunt, "'will not be reluctant to confide in me.' "'My aunt withdrew her eyes from mine, "'as slowly as she had turned them upon me, "'and covered them thoughtfully with her hand.' By and by she put her other hand on my shoulder, and so we both sat looking into the past without saying another word until we parted for the night. I rode away early in the morning for the scene of my old school days. I cannot say that I was yet quite happy in the hope that I was gaining a victory over myself, even in the prospect of so soon looking on her face again. This well-remembered ground was soon traversed, and I came to the quiet streets where every stone was a boy's book to me. I went on foot to the old house, and went away with a heart too full to enter. I returned, and, looking as I passed through the low window of the turret-room where first Uriah Heap and afterwards Mr. Micawber had been wont to sit, I saw that it was a little parlour now, and that there was no office. Otherwise the staid old house was, as to its cleanliness and order, just as it had been when I first saw it. I requested the new maid who admitted me to tell Miss Wickfield that a gentleman who waited on her from a friend abroad was there, and I was shown up the grave old staircase, cautioned of the steps I knew so well, into the unchanged drawing-room. The books that Agnes and I had read together were on their shelves, and the desk where I had laboured at my lessons many a night stood yet at the same old corner of the table. All the little changes that had crept in when the heaps were there were changed again. Everything was as it used to be in the happy time. I stood in a window and looked across the ancient street at the opposite houses, recalling how I had watched them on wet afternoons when I first came there and how I used to speculate about the people who appeared at any of the windows, and had followed them with my eyes up and down the stairs, while women went clicking along the pavement in patterns, and the dull rain fell in slanting lines and poured out of the water-spout yonder and flowed into the road. The feeling with which I used to watch the tramps as they came into town on those wet evenings at dusk and limped past, with their bundles drooping over their shoulders at the end of sticks, came freshly back to me 
fraught as then with the smell of damp earth and wet leaves and briar, and the sensation of the very airs that blew upon me in my own toilsome journey. The opening of the little door in the panelled wall made me start and turn. Her beautiful, serene eyes met mine as she came towards me. She stopped and laid her hand upon her bosom, and I caught her in my arms. "'Agnes, my dear girl, I have come too suddenly upon you. No, no, I am so rejoiced to see you, Trotwood. Dear Agnes, the happiness it is to me to see you once again.' I folded her to my heart, and for a little while we were both silent. Presently we sat down side by side, and her angel face was turned upon me with a welcome I had dreamed of, waking and sleeping for whole years. She was so true, she was so beautiful, she was so good. I owed her so much gratitude, she was so dear to me, that I could find no utterance for what I felt. I tried to bless her, tried to thank her, tried to tell her, as I had often done in letters, what an influence she had upon me. But all my efforts were in vain. My love and joy were dumb. With her own sweet tranquillity she calmed my agitation, led me back to the time of our parting, spoke to me of Emily, whom she had visited in secret many times, spoke to me tenderly of Dora's grave. With the unerring instinct of her noble heart she touched the chords of my memory so softly and harmoniously that not one jarred within me. I could listen to the sorrowful distant music and desire to shrink from nothing it awoke. How could I, when blended with it all, was her dear self, the better angel of my life? "'And you, Agnes,' said I, by and by, "'tell me of yourself. You have hardly ever told me of your own life in all this lapse of time.' "'What should I tell?' she answered with a radiant smile. "'Papa is well. You see us here, quiet in our own home, our anxieties set at rest, our home is restored to us, and knowing that, dear Trotwood, you know all.' "'All, Agnes,' said I. She looked at me with some fluttering wonder in her face. "'Is there anything else, sister?' said I. Her colour, which just now faded, returned and faded again. She smiled with a quiet sadness, I thought, and shook her head. I had sought to lead her to what my aunt had hinted at, for sharply painful to me as it must be to receive that confidence. I was to discipline my heart and to do my duty to her— I saw, however, that she was uneasy, and I let it pass. "'Have you much to do, dear Agnes?' "'With my school?' she said, looking up again, in all her bright composure. "'Yes, it is laborious, is it not?' "'The labour is so pleasant,' she returned, "'that it is scarcely grateful to me to call it by that name.' "'Nothing is difficult to you,' said I. Her colour came and went once more, and once more, as she bent her head, I saw the same sad smile." "'You will wait and see Papa,' said Agnes cheerfully, "'and pass the day with us. "'Perhaps you will sleep in your own room. "'We always call it yours.' "'I could not do that, having promised to ride back to my aunt's at night, "'but I would pass the day there, joyfully.' "'I must be a prisoner for a little while,' said Agnes. "'But here are the old books, Trotwood, and the old music.' "'Even the old flowers are here,' said I, looking round, "'or the old kinds.' "'I have found a pleasure.' returned Agnes, smiling, while you have been absent, in keeping everything as it used to be when we were children. For we were very happy then, I think. Heaven knows we were, said I. And every little thing that has reminded me of my brother, said Agnes, with her cordial eyes turned cheerfully upon me, has been a welcome companion. Even this, showing me the basket trifle full of keys, still hanging at her side, seems to jingle with a kind of old tune— she smiled again, and went out at the door by which she had come in. It was for me to guard this sisterly affection with religious care. It was all that I had left myself, and it was a treasure. If I once shook the foundations of the sacred confidence and usage, in virtue of which it was given to me, it was lost and could never be recovered. I set this steadily before myself. The better I loved her, the more it behoved me never to forget it. I walked through the streets, and once more seeing my old adversary the butcher, now a constable, with his staff hanging up in the shop, went down to look at the old place where I had fought him, and there meditated on Miss Shepherd and the eldest Miss Larkins, and all the idle loves and likings and dislikings of that time. 
Nothing seemed to have survived that time but Agnes, and she, ever a star above me, was brighter and higher. When I returned, Mr. Wickfield had come home, from a garden he had a couple of miles or so out of town, where he now employed himself almost every day. I found him as my aunt had described him. We sat down to dinner with some half-dozen little girls, and he seemed but the shadow of his handsome picture on the wall. The tranquillity and peace belonging of old to that quiet ground in my memory pervaded it again. When dinner was done, Mr. Wickfield, taking no wine and I desiring none, we went upstairs where Agnes and her little charges sang and played and worked. After tea the children left us, and we three sat together talking of the bygone days. "'My part in them,' said Mr. Wickfield, shaking his white head, "'has much matter for regret, for deep regret and deep contrition, Trot, would you well know, but I would not cancel it if it were in my power.' I could readily believe that, looking at the face beside him. I should cancel with it, he pursued, such patience and devotion, such fidelity, such a child's love as I must not forget. No, even to forget myself. I understand you, sir, I softly said. I hold it, I have always held it, in veneration. But no one knows, not even you, he returned, how much she has done, how much she has undergone, how hard she has striven. "'Dear Agnes!' She had put her hand entreatingly on his arm to stop him, and was very, very pale. "'Well, well,' he said with a sigh, dismissing, as I then saw, some trial she had borne, or was yet to bear, in connection with what my aunt had told me. "'Well, well, I have never told you, Trotwood, of her mother. Has anyone?' "'Never, sir. It is not much, though it was much to suffer.' She married me in opposition to her father's wish, and he renounced her. She prayed him to forgive her, before my Agnes came into this world. He was a very hard man, and her mother had long been dead. He repulsed her. He broke her heart. Agnes leaned upon his shoulder and stole her arm about his neck. She had an affectionate and gentle heart, he said, and it was broken. I knew its tender nature very well. No one could if I did not. She loved me dearly, but was never happy. She was always labouring in secret under this distress, and being delicate and downcast at the time of his last repulse, for it was not his first by many, pined away and died. She left me Agnes, two weeks old, and the grey hair that you recollect me with when you first came. He kissed Agnes on her cheek. My love for my dear child was a diseased love, but my mind was all unhealthy then. I say no more of that. I am not speaking of myself, Trotwood, but of her mother, and of her. If I give you any clue to what I am, or what I have been, you will unravel it, I know. What Agnes is, I need not say. I have always read something of her poor mother's story in her character, and so I tell it to you to-night, when we three are together again, after such great changes. I have told it all. He bowed his head and her angel face and filial duty derived a more pathetic meaning from it than they had had before. If I had wanted anything by which to mark this night of our reunion, I should have found it in this. Agnes rose up from her father's side before long, and going softly to her piano, played some of the old airs to which we had often listened in that place. "'Have you any intention of going away again?' she asked me as I was standing by. "'What does my sister say to that?' I hope not. Then I have no such intention, Agnes. I think you ought not, Trotwood, since you ask me, she said mildly. Your growing reputation and success enlarge your power of doing good, and if I could spare my brother, with her eyes upon me, perhaps the time could not. What I am, you have made me, Agnes. You should know best. I made you, Trotwood? Yes, Agnes, my dear girl, said I, bending to her. I tried to tell you when we met today something that has been in my thoughts since Dora died. You remember when you came down to me in our little room, pointing upward, Agnes? Oh, Trotwood, she returned, her eyes filled with tears. So loving, so confiding, and so young, can I ever forget? As you were then, my sister, I have often thought since you have ever been to me ever pointing upward, Agnes, ever leading me to something better, ever directing me to higher things. She only shook her head. 
Through her tears I saw the same sad, quiet smile. And I am so grateful to you for it, Agnes, so bound to you, that there is no name for the affection of my heart. I want you to know, yet don't know how to tell you, that all my life long I shall look up to you, and be guided by you, as I have been through the darkness that has passed. Whatever betides, whatever new ties you may form, whatever changes may come between us, I shall always look to you, and love you as I do now, and have always done. You will always be my solace and resource, as you have always been. Until I die, my dearest sister, I shall see you always before me, pointing upward. She put her hand in mine, and told me she was proud of me, and of what I said, although I praised her very far beyond her worth. Then she went on, softly playing, but without removing her eyes from me. "'Do you know, what I have heard to-night, Agnes,' said I, "'strangely seems to be a part of the feeling with which I regarded you when I saw you first, with which I sat beside you in my rough school days.' "'You knew I had no mother,' she replied with a smile, and felt kindly towards me. "'More than that, Agnes, I knew, almost as if I had known this story, "'that there was something inexplicably gentle and softened surrounding you, "'something that might have been sorrowful in someone else, "'as I can now understand it was, but was not so in you.' "'She played softly on, looking at me still. "'Will you laugh at my cherishing such fancies, Agnes?' "'No.' or at my saying that I really believe I felt, even then, that you could be faithfully affectionate against all discouragement, and never cease to be so until you cease to live. Will you laugh at such a dream? Oh, no, oh, no. For an instant a distressful shadow crossed her face, but even in the start it gave me it was gone, and she was playing on and looking at me with her own calm smile. As I rode back in the lonely night, the wind going by me like a restless memory, I thought of this, and feared she was not happy. I was not happy, but thus far I had faithfully set the seal upon the past, and thinking of her pointing upward, thought of her as pointing to the sky above me, where, in the mystery to come, I might yet love her with a love unknown on earth, and tell her what the strife had been within me when I loved her here. End of chapter 60「Chapter 61 of David Copperfield – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tyg Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens – Chapter 61 I am shown two interesting penitents. For a time, at all events until my book should be completed, which would be the work of several months, I took up my abode in my aunt's house at Dover, and there, sitting in the window from which I had looked out at the moon upon the sea, when that roof first gave me shelter, I quietly pursued my task. In pursuance of my intention of referring to my own fictions only when their course should incidentally connect itself with the progress of my story, I do not enter on the aspirations, the delights, anxieties, and triumphs of my art. That I truly devoted myself to it with my strongest earnestness, and bestowed upon it every energy of my soul, I have already said. If the books I have written be of any worth, they will supply the rest. I shall otherwise have written to poor purpose, and the rest will be of interest to no one. Occasionally I went to London, to lose myself in the swarm of life there, or to consult with Traddles on some business point. He had managed for me in my absence with the soundest judgment, and my worldly affairs were prospering. As my notoriety began to bring upon me an enormous quantity of letters from people of whom I had no knowledge, chiefly about nothing and extremely difficult to answer, I agreed with Traddles to have my name painted up on his door. There the devoted postman on that beat delivered bushels of letters for me, and there at intervals I laboured through them, like a home secretary of state without the salary. Among this correspondence there dropped in every now and then an obliging proposal from one of the numerous outsiders always lurking about the commons, to practice under cover of my name, if I would take the necessary steps remaining to make a proctor of myself and pay me a percentage of the profits, but I declined these offers, being already aware that there were plenty of such covert practitioners in existence, and considering the commons quite bad enough without my doing anything to make it worse. 
The girls had gone home when my name burst into bloom on Traddles's door, and the sharp boy looked all day as if he had never heard of Sophie shut up in the back room, glancing down from her work into a sooty little strip of garden with a pump in it. But there I always found her, the same bright housewife, often humming her Devonshire ballads when no strange foot was coming up the stairs, and blunting the sharp boy in his official closet with melody. I wondered at first why I so often found Sophie writing in a copy-book, and why she always shut it up when I appeared, and hurried it into the table-drawer. But the secret soon came out. One day Traddles, who had just come home through the drizzling sleet from court, took a paper out of his desk and asked me what I thought of that handwriting. "'Oh, don't, Tom!' cried Sophie, who was warming his slippers before the fire. "'My dear!' returned Tom, in a delighted state. "'Why not? What do you say to that writing, Copperfield?' "'It's extraordinarily legal and formal,' said I. "'I don't think I ever saw such a stiff hand.' "'Not like a lady's hand, is it?' said Traddles. "'A lady's,' I repeated. "'Bricks and mortar are more like a lady's hand.' Traddles broke into a rapturous laugh, and informed me that it was Sophie's writing, that Sophie had vowed and declared he would need a copying clerk soon, and she would be that clerk.' that she had acquired this hand from a pattern, and that she could throw off, I forget how many, folios an hour. Sophie was very much confused by my being told all this, and said that when Tom was made a judge, he wouldn't be so ready to proclaim it, which Tom denied, averring that he should always be equally proud of it under all circumstances. "'What a thoroughly good and charming wife she is, my dear Traddles,' said I when she had gone away laughing. "'My dear Copperfield,' returned Traddles, "'she is, without any exception, the dearest girl. "'The way she manages this place, "'her punctuality, domestic knowledge, economy and order, "'her cheerfulness, Copperfield.' "'Indeed, you have reason to commend her,' I returned. "'You are a happy fellow. "'I believe you make yourselves and each other two of the happiest people in the world.' "'I am sure we are two of the happiest people,' returned Traddles. "'I admit that at all events. "'Bless my soul, when I see her getting up by candlelight on these dark mornings, "'busying herself in the day's arrangements, "'going out to market before the clerks come into the inn, "'caring for no weather, devising the most capital little dinners "'out of the plainest materials, making puddings and pies, "'keeping everything in its right place, "'always so neat and ornamental herself, "'sitting up at night with me if it's ever so late.' "'sweet-tempered and encouraging always, and all for me. "'I positively sometimes can't believe it, Copperfield.' "'He was tender of the very slippers she had been warming as he put them on, "'and stretched his feet enjoyingly upon the fender. "'I positively sometimes can't believe it,' said Traddles. "'Then our pleasures, dear me, they are inexpensive, but they are quite wonderful.' When we are at home here of an evening, and shut the outer door, and draw those curtains, which she made, where could we be more snug? When it's fine, and we go out for a walk in the evening, the streets abound in enjoyment for us. We look into the glittering windows of the jeweller's shops, and I show Sophie which of the diamond-eyed serpents, coiled up on white satin rising grounds, I would give her if I could afford it. "'and Sophie shows me which of the gold watches "'that are capped and jewelled and engine-turned "'and possessed of the horizontal lever-escape movement "'and all sorts of things "'she would buy for me if she could afford it, "'and we pick out the spoons and forks and fish slices, "'butter-knives and sugar-tongs. "'We should both prefer if we could both afford it, "'and really we go away as if we had got them. "'Then we stroll into the squares and great streets "'and see a house to let, "'and sometimes we look up at it and say... "'How would that do if I was made a judge? "'And we'd parcel it out, such a room for us, "'such rooms for the girls, and so forth, "'until we settled to our satisfaction "'that it would do, or it wouldn't do, as the case may be. "'Sometimes we go at half price to the pit of the theatre, "'the very smell of which is cheap, in my opinion, at the money, "'and there we thoroughly enjoy the play, "'which Sophie believes every word of, and so do I.' <laughs> In walking home, perhaps we buy a little bit of something at a cook-shop, or a little lobster at the fishmonger's, and bring it here, and make a splendid supper, chatting about what we had seen. Now, you know, Copperfield, if I was Lord Chancellor, we couldn't do this. You would do something, whatever you were, my dear Traddles, thought I, that would be pleasant and amiable. And by the way, I said aloud, I suppose you never draw any skeletons now. Really, Traddles replied, laughing and reddening. 
I can't wholly deny that I do, my dear Copperfield, for being in one of the back rows of the King's Bench the other day, with a pen in my hand, the fancy came into my head to try how I preserved that accomplishment, and I'm afraid to say there's a skeleton, in a wig, on the ledge of the desk. After we both laughed heartily, Traddles wound up by looking with a smile at the fire and saying, in his forgiving way, "'Old Creakle!' "'I have a letter from that old rascal here,' said I, "'for I never was less disposed to forgive him the way he used to batter Traddles "'than when I saw Traddles so ready to forgive him himself.' "'From Creakle, the schoolmaster?' exclaimed Traddles. "'No!' "'Among the persons who were attracted to me in my rising fame and fortune,' said I, "'looking over my letters, and who discovered that they were always much attached to me, "'is the self-same Creakle. "'He is not a schoolmaster now, Traddles. He is retired.' He is a Middlesex magistrate. I thought Traddles might be surprised to hear it, but he was not so at all. How do you suppose he comes to be a Middlesex magistrate? said I. Oh, dear me, replied Traddles. It would be very difficult to answer that question. Perhaps he voted for somebody, or lent money to somebody, or bought something of somebody, or otherwise obliged somebody, or jobbed for somebody, who knew somebody who got the lieutenant of the county to nominate him for the commission. "'On the commission he is, at any rate,' said I, "'and he writes to me here that he will be glad to show me, in operation, "'the only true system of prison discipline, "'the only unchallengeable way of making sincere and lasting converts and penitents, "'which, you know, is by solitary confinement. "'What do you say?' "'To the system?' inquired Traddles, looking grave. "'No, to my accepting the offer, and your going with me.' "'I don't object,' said Traddles. "'Then I'll write to say so. "'You remember?' To say nothing of our treatment, this same Creakle turning his son out of doors, I suppose, and the life he used to lead his wife and daughter. Perfectly, said Traddles. Yet, if you read this letter, you'll find he is the tenderest of men to prisoners convicted of the whole calendar of felonies, said I, though I can't find that his tenderness extends to any other class of created beings. Traddles shrugged his shoulders and was not at all surprised. I had not expected him to be, and was not surprised myself, though my observation of similar practical satires would have been but scanty. We arranged the time of our visit, and I wrote accordingly to Mr. Creakle that evening. On the appointed day, I think it was the next day, but no matter, Traddles and I repaired to the prison where Mr. Creakle was powerful. It was an immense and solid building, erected at a vast expense. I could not help thinking, as we approached the gate, what an uproar would have been made in the country if any deluded man had proposed to spend one half of the money it had cost on the erection of an industrial school for the young, or a house of refuge for the deserving old. In an office that might have been on the ground floor of the Tower of Babel, it was so immensely constructed, we were presented to our old schoolmaster, who was one of a group composed of two or three of the busier sorts of magistrates, and some visitors they had brought. He received me like a man who had formed my mind in bygone years, and had always loved me tenderly. On my introducing Traddles, Mr. Creakle expressed in like manner, but in an inferior degree, that he had always been Traddles's guide, philosopher, and friend. Our venerable instructor was a great deal older, and not improved in appearance. His face was as fiery as ever, his eyes were as small and rather deeper set. The scanty, wet-looking grey hair, by which I remember him, was almost gone, and the thick veins in his bald head were none the more agreeable to look at. After some conversation among these gentlemen, from which I might have supposed that there was nothing in the world to be legitimately taken into account, but the supreme comfort of prisoners, at any expense, and nothing on the wide earth to be done outside prison doors, we began our inspection. It being then just dinner-time, we went first into the great kitchen, where every prisoner's dinner was in course of being set out separately, to be handed to him in a cell, with a regularity and precision of clockwork. I said aside to Traddles that I wondered whether it occurred to anybody that there was a striking contrast between these plentiful repasts of choice quality and the dinners, not to say of paupers, but of soldiers, sailors, labourers, the great bulk of the honest working community, of whom not one man in five hundred ever dined half so well. But I learned that the system required high living, and, in short, to dispose of the system once for all, 
I found that on that head and all others the system put an end to all doubts and disposed of all anomalies. Nobody appeared to have the least idea that there was any other system but the system to be considered. As we were going through some of the magnificent passages, I inquired of Mr. Creakle and his friends what were supposed to be the main advantages of this all-governing and universally overriding system. I found them to be the perfect isolation of prisoners, so that no one man in confinement there knew anything about another, and the reduction of prisoners to a wholesome state of mind leading to sincere contrition and repentance. Now, it struck me when we began to visit individuals in their cells, and to traverse the passages in which those cells were, and to have the manner of the going to chapel and so forth explained to us, that there was a strong probability of the prisoners knowing a good deal about each other, and of their carrying on a pretty complete system of intercourse. This, by the time I write, has been proved, I believe, to be the case. But, as it would have been flat blasphemy against the system to have hinted such a doubt then, I looked out for the penitence as diligently as I could. And here again I had great misgivings. I found as prevalent a fashion in the form of the penitence as I had left outside in the forms of the coats and waistcoats in the windows of the tailor shops. I found a vast amount of profession, varying very little in character, varying very little, which I thought exceedingly suspicious, even in words. I found a great many foxes disparaging whole vineyards of inaccessible grapes, uh, but I found very few foxes whom I would have trusted within reach of a bunch. Above all, I found that the most professing men were the greatest objects of interest, and that their conceit, their vanity, their want of excitement, and their love of deception, which many of them possessed to an almost incredible extent, as their history showed, all prompted to these professions, and were all gratified by them. However, I heard so repeatedly in the course of our goings to and fro of a certain number twenty-seven, who was the favourite, and who really appeared to be the model prisoner, that I resolved to suspend my judgment until I should see twenty-seven. Twenty-eight, I understood, was also a bright particular star, but it was his misfortune to have his glory a little dimmed by the extraordinary lustre of twenty-seven. I heard so much of twenty-seven, of his pious admonitions to everybody around him, and of the beautiful letters he constantly wrote to his mother, whom he seemed to consider in a very bad way, that I became quite impatient to see him. I had to restrain my impatience for some time, on account of twenty-seven being reserved for a concluding effect. But at last we came to the door of his cell, and Mr. Creakle, looking through a little hole in it, reported to us in a state of the greatest admiration that he was reading a hymn-book. There was such a rush of heads immediately to see number 27 reading his hymn-book, that the little hole was blocked up six or seven heads deep. To remedy this inconvenience, and give us an opportunity of conversing with twenty-seven in all his purity, Mr. Creakle directed the door of the cell to be unlocked, and twenty-seven to be invited out into the passage. This was done, and whom should Traddles and I then behold, to our amazement, in this converted number twenty-seven, but Uriah Heep. He knew us directly, and said as he came out with the old writhe, "'How do you do, Mr. Copperfield?' How do you do, Mr. Traddles? This recognition caused a general admiration in the party. I rather thought that everyone was struck by his not being proud and taking notice of us. Well, twenty-seven, said Mr. Creakle, mournfully admiring him, how do you find yourself today? I am very humble, sir, replied Uriah Heep. You are always so, twenty-seven, said Mr. Creakle. Here another gentleman asked with extreme anxiety, are you quite comfortable? Yes, I thank you, sir, said Uriah, looking in that direction. Far more comfortable here than ever I was outside. I see my follies now, sir. That's what makes me comfortable. Several gentlemen were much affected, and a third questioner, forcing himself to the front, inquired with extreme feeling, How do you find the beef? Thank you, sir, replied Uriah, glancing in the new direction of this voice. It was tougher yesterday than I could wish, but it's my duty to bear. I have committed follies, gentlemen, said Uriah, looking round with a meek smile, and I ought to bear the consequences without repining. 
a murmur partly of gratification at twenty-seven celestial state of mind, and partly of indignation against the contractor who had given him any cause of complaint, a note of which was immediately made by Mr. Creakle, having subsided, twenty-seven stood in the midst of us, as if he felt himself the principal object of merit in a highly meritorious museum that we the neophytes might have an excess of light shining upon us all at once orders were given to let out twenty-eight i had been so much astonished already that i only felt a kind of resigned wonder when mr littimer walked forth reading a good book twenty-eight said the gentleman at spectacles who had not yet spoken you complained last week my good fellow of the cocoa how has it been since i thank you sir said Mr. Littimer. It has been better made. If I might take the liberty of saying so, sir, I don't think the milk which is boiled with it is quite genuine. I am quite aware, sir, that there is a great adulteration of milk in London, and that the article in a pure state is difficult to be obtained. It appeared to me that the gentleman in spectacles backed his twenty-eight against Mr. Creakle's twenty-seven, for each of them took his own man in hand. Uh, "'What is your state of mind, twenty-eight? said the questioner in spectacles. "'I thank you, sir,' returned Mr. Littimer. "'I see my follies now, sir. I am a good deal troubled when I think of the sins of my former companion, sir. But I trust they may find forgiveness.' "'You are quite happy with yourself,' said the questioner, nodding encouragement. "'I am much obliged to you, sir,' returned Mr. Littimer. Uh, "'Perfectly so.' "'Is there anything at all on your mind now?' said the questioner. "'If so, mention it, twenty-eight. Uh, "'Sir,' said Mr. Littimer, without looking up, "'if my eyes have not deceived me, "'there is a gentleman present who is acquainted with me in my former life. "'It may be profitable to that gentleman to know, sir, "'that I attribute my past follies entirely to having lived a thoughtless life "'in the service of young men, "'that to having allowed myself to be led by them into weakness, "'which I had not the strength to resist. "'I hope that gentleman will take warning, sir, "'and will not be offended at my freedom. "'It is for his good. "'I am conscious of my own past follies. "'I hope he may repent of all the wickedness and sin "'to which he has been a party.' "'I observed that several gentlemen were shading their eyes, "'each with one hand, as if they had just come into church.' "'This does you credit, Twenty-Eight, returned the questioner. "'I should have expected it of you. Is there anything else?' "'Sir,' returned Littimer, slightly lifting up his eyebrows, but not his eyes, "'there is a young woman who fell into dissolute courses, "'that I endeavoured to save, sir, but could not rescue. "'I beg that gentleman, if he has it in his power, "'to inform that young woman from me "'that I forgive her her bad conduct towards myself, "'and that I call her to repentance, if he will be so good.' "'I have no doubt, Twenty-Eight, returned the questioner, "'that the gentleman you refer to feels very strongly, "'as we all must, what you have so properly said. Uh, "'We will not detain you.' "'I thank you, sir,' said Mr. Littimer. "'Gentlemen, I wish you good day, "'and hoping you and your families will also see your wickedness and amend.' With this, number twenty-eight retired, after a glance between him and Uriah, as if they were not altogether unknown to each other, through some medium of communication, and a murmur went round the group as his door shut upon him, uh, that he was a most respectable man, and a beautiful case. "'Now, twenty-seven, said Mr. Creakle, entering on a clear stage with his man, "'is there anything that anyone can do for you? If so, mention it.' "'I would humbly ask, sir.' returned Uriah, with a jerk of his malevolent head, for leave to write again to mother. "'It shall certainly be granted,' said Mr. Creakle. "'Thank you, sir. I am anxious about mother. I am afraid she ain't safe.' Somebody incautiously asked from what, but there was a scandalised whisper of, "'Hush!' "'Immortally safe, sir,' returned Uriah, writhing in the direction of the voice. "'I should wish mother to be got into my state.' I never should have been got into my present state if I hadn't come here. I wish Mother had come here. It would be better for everybody if they could be took up and was brought here. This sentiment gave unbounded satisfaction, a greater satisfaction, I think, than anything that had passed yet. Before I come here, said Uriah, stealing a look at us, as if he would have blighted the outer world to which we belonged if he could, 
I was given to follies, but now I am sensible of my follies. There's a deal of sin outside. There's a deal of sin in mother. There's nothing but sin everywhere, except dear. You are quite changed, said Mr. Creakle. Oh, dear, yes, sir, cried his hopeful penitent. You wouldn't relapse if you were going out, asked somebody else. Oh, dear, now, sir. Well, said Mr. Creakle, this is very gratifying. You have addressed Mr. Copperfield, 27. Do you wish to say anything further to him? You knew me a long time before I came here and was changed, Mr. Copperfield, said Uriah, looking at me, and a more villainous look I never saw, even on his visage. You knew me when, in spite of my follies, I was humble among them that was proud, and meek among them that was violent. You was violent to me yourself, Mr. Copperfield. Once you struck me a blow in the face, you know. The general commiseration, several indignant glances directed at me. But I forgive you, Mr. Copperfield, said Uriah, making his forgiving nature the subject of a most impious and awful parallel, which I shall not record. I forgive everybody. It would ill become me to bear malice. I freely forgive you, and I hope you'll curb your passion in future. I hope Mr. W. will repent, and Miss W., and all of that sinful lot. You've been visited with affliction, and I hope it may do you good. But you'd better have come here. Mr. W. had better have come here, and Miss W. too. The best wish I could give you, Mr. Copperfield, and give all of you gentlemen, is that you could be took up and brought here. When I think of my past follies and my present state, I am sure it would be best for you. I pity all who ain't brought here. He sneaked back into his cell amidst a little chorus of approbation, and both Traddles and I experienced a great relief when he was locked in. It was a characteristic feature in this repentance that I was fain to ask what these two men had done to be there at all. That appeared to be the last thing about which they had anything to say. I addressed myself to one of the two warders, who, I suspected from certain latent indications in their faces, knew pretty well what all this stir was worth. "'Do you know,' said I, as we walked along the passage, "'what felony was number twenty-seven's last folly?' "'The answer was that it was a bank case. "'A fraud on the Bank of England?' I asked. "'Yes, sir. Fraud, forgery, and conspiracy. "'He and some others. He set the others on. "'It was a deep plot for a large sum. "'Sentence, transportation for life. Twenty-seven was the knowingest bird of the lot, "'and he had very nearly kept himself safe, but not quite.' The bank was just able to put salt on his tail, and only just. But do you know Twenty-Eight's offence? Uh, Twenty-Eight, returned my informant, speaking throughout in a low tone, and looking over his shoulder as we walked along the passage, to guard himself from being overheard, in such an unlawful reference to these immaculates, by Creakle and the rest. Twenty-Eight, also transportation, got a place and robbed the young master of a matter of two hundred and fifty pounds in money and valuables the night before they were going abroad. I particularly recollect his case from his being took by a dwarf. A what? A little woman. Well, I forgot her name. Uh, not Moucher. That's it. He had eluded pursuit and was going to America in a flaxen wig and whiskers and such a complete disguise as never you see in all your born days. When the little woman, being in Southampton, Met him walking along the street, picked him out with a sharp eye in a moment, ran betwixt his legs to upset him, and held on to him like grim death. "'Excellent, Miss Boucher! cried I. "'You'd have said so if you'd have seen her standing on a chair in the witness-box at the trial, as I did,' said my friend. He cut her face right open, and pounded her in the most brutal manner when she took him, but she never loosed her hold on him till he was locked up. She held so tight to him, in fact, that the officers were obliged to take them both together. She gave her evidence in the gamest way, and was highly complimented by the bench, and cheered right home to her lodgings. She said in court that she'd have took him single-handed, on account of what she knew concerning him, if he had been Samson, and it's my belief she would. <laughs> it was mine, too, and I highly respected Miss Boucher for it. We had now seen all there was to see. It would have been vain to represent to such a man as the worshipful Mr. Creakle that twenty-seven and twenty-eight were perfectly consistent and unchanged, that exactly what they were then they had always been, 
that the hypocritical knaves were just the subjects to make that sort of profession in such a place that they knew its market value at least as well as we did in the immediate service it would do them when they were expatriated in a word that it was a rotten hollow painfully suggestive piece of business altogether we left them to their system and their cells and went home wondering "'Perhaps it's a good thing, Traddles,' said I, "'to have an unsound hobby ridden hard, "'for it's the sooner ridden to death.' "'I hope so,' replied Traddles. End of chapter 61「Chapter 62 of David Copperfield "'This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Recording by Tyg Hines.' David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Chapter 62 A Light Shines on My Way The year came round to Christmas time, and I had been at home above two months. I had seen Agnes frequently. However loud the general voice might be in giving me encouragement, and however fervent the emotions and endeavours to which it roused me, I heard her lightest word of praise as I heard nothing else. At least once a week, and sometimes oftener, I rode over there and passed the evening. I usually rode back at night, for the old unhappy sense was always hovering about me now, most sorrowfully when I left her, and I was glad to be up and out rather than wandering over the past in weary wakefulness or miserable dreams. I wore away the longest part of many wild, sad nights in those rides, reviving as I went the thoughts that had occupied me in my long absence. Or, if I were to say rather that I listened to the echoes of those thoughts, I should better express the truth. They spoke to me from afar off. I had put them at a distance, and accepted my inevitable place. When I read to Agnes what I wrote, when I saw her listening face fix, moved her to smiles or tears, or heard her cordial voice, so earnest in the shadowy events of that imaginative world in which I lived, I thought what a fate mine might have been, but only thought so, as I had thought after I was married to Dora, what I could have wished my wife to be. My duty to Agnes, who loved me with a love which, if I disquieted, I wronged most selfishly and poorly, and could never restore, my matured assurance that I, who had worked out my own destiny and won what I had impetuously set my heart on, had no right to murmur and must bear, comprised what I felt and what I had learned. But I loved her and now it even became some consolation to me vaguely to conceive a distant day when I might blamelessly avow it, when all this should be over, when I could say, Agnes, so it was when I came home, and now I am old, and I never have loved since. She did not once show me any change in herself. What she always had been to me she still was, wholly unaltered. Between my aunt and me there had been something in this connection since the night of my return, which I cannot call a restraint or an avoidance of the subject, so much as an implied understanding that we thought of it together, but did not shape our thoughts into words. When, according to our old custom, we sat before the fire at night, we often fell into this train, as naturally and as consciously to each other as if we had unreservedly said so. But we preserved an unbroken silence. I believed that she had read, or partly read, my thoughts that night, and that she fully comprehended why I gave mine no more distinct expression. This Christmas time being come, and Agnes having reposed no new confidence in me, a doubt that had several times arisen in my mind, whether she could have that perception of the true state of my breast, which restrained her with the apprehension of giving me pain, began to oppress me heavily. If that were so, my sacrifice was nothing my plainest obligation to her unfulfilled, and every poor action I had shrunk from I was hourly doing. I resolved to set this right beyond all doubt, there's such a barrier were between us, to break it down at once with a determined hand. It was, what lasting reason I have to remember it, a cold, harsh winter day. There had been snow some hours before, and it lay, not deep, but hard frozen on the ground. Out at sea, beyond my window, the wind blew ruggedly from the north. I had been thinking of it sweeping over those mountain wastes of snow in Switzerland, then inaccessible to any human foot, and had been speculating which was the lonelier, those solitary regions or a deserted ocean. "'Riding to-day, Trot,' said my aunt, putting her head in at the door. 
"'Yes,' said I. "'I'm going over to Canterbury. It's a good day for a ride.' "'I hope your horse may think so, too,' said my aunt. Uh, "'But at present he is holding down his head and his ears, standing before the door there, as if he thought his stable preferable.' My aunt, I may observe, allowed my horse on the forbidden ground, but had not at all relented towards the donkeys. "'He will be fresh enough presently,' said I. "'The ride will do his master good at all events,' observed my aunt, glancing at the papers on my table. "'Ah, child, you pass a good many hours here. I never thought, when I used to read books, what work it was to write them. "'It's work enough to read them sometimes,' I returned. "'As to the writing, it has its own charms, aunt.' "'Ah, I see,' said my aunt. "'Ambition, love of approbation, sympathy, and much more, I suppose. "'Well, go along with you.' "'Do you know anything more?' said I, standing composedly before her. She had patted me on the shoulder and sat down in my chair. "'Of that attachment of Agnes.' She looked up in my face a little while before replying. "'I think I do, Trot.' "'Are you confirmed in your impression?' I inquired. "'I think I am, Trot.' She looked so steadfastly at me, with a kind of doubt or pity or suspense in her affection, that I summoned the stronger determination to show her a perfectly cheerful face. "'And what is more, Trot?' said my aunt. "'Yes?' "'I think Agnes is going to be married.' "'Oh, God bless her!' said I cheerfully. "'God bless her!' said my aunt. "'And her husband, too.' I echoed it, parted from my aunt, and went lightly downstairs, mounted and rode away. There was greater reason than before to do what I had resolved to do. How well I recollect the wintry ride, the frozen particles of ice brushed from the blades of grass by the wind and borne across my face, the hard clatter of the horse's hoofs beating a tune upon the ground, the stiff-tilled soil, the snowdrift lightly eddying in the chalk-pit as the breeze ruffled it, the smoking team with a wagon of old hay stopping to breathe on the hilltop and shaking their bells musically the whitened slopes and sweeps of downland lying against the dark sky, as if they were drawn on a huge slate. I found Agnes alone. The little girls had gone to their own homes now, and she was alone by the fire reading. She put down her book on seeing me come in, and having welcomed me as usual, took her work-basket and sat in one of the old-fashioned windows. I sat beside her on the window-seat, and we talked of what I was doing, and when it would be done, and of the progress I had made since my last visit. Agnes was very cheerful, and laughingly predicted that I should soon become too famous to be talked to on such subjects. "'So I make the most of the present time, you see,' said Agnes, "'and talk to you while I may.' As I looked at her beautiful face, observant of her work, she raised her mild, clear eyes, and saw that I was looking at her. "'You are thoughtful to-day, Trotwood.' "'Agnes, shall I tell you what about? I came to tell you.' She put aside her work, as she was used to do when we were seriously discussing anything, and gave me her whole attention. Uh, "'My dear Agnes, do you doubt my being true to you?' "'No,' she answered with a look of astonishment. "'Do you doubt my being what I always have been to you?' "'No,' she answered as before. "'Do you remember what I tried to tell you when I came home?' What a debt of gratitude I owed you, dearest Agnes, and how fervently I felt towards you. I remember it, she said gently, very well. You have a secret, said I. Let me share it, Agnes. She cast down her eyes and trembled. I could hardly fail to know, even if I had not heard, but from other lips than yours, Agnes, which seems strange, that there is someone upon whom you have bestowed the treasure of your love. Do not shut me out of what concerns your happiness so nearly. If you can trust me, as you say you can, and as I know you may, let me be your friend, your brother, in this matter, of all others. With an appealing, almost a reproachful glance, she rose from the window, and, hurrying across the room as if without knowing where, put her hands before her face, and burst into such tears as smote me to the heart. And yet they awakened something in me, bringing promise to my heart. Without my knowing why, these tears allied themselves to the quietly sad smile which was so fixed in my remembrance, and shook me more with hope than fear or sorrow. Agnes, sister, dearest, what have I done? Let me go away, Trotwood. I am not well. I am not myself. I will speak to you by and by, another time. I will write to you. Don't speak to me now. Don't. Don't. 
I sought to recollect what she had said when I had spoken to her on that former night of her affection needing no return. It seemed a very world that I must search through in a moment. Agnes, I cannot bear to see you so and think that I have been the cause. My dearest girl, dearer to me than anything in life, if you are unhappy, let me share your unhappiness. If you are in need of help or counsel, let me try to give it to you. If you have indeed a burden on your heart, let me try to lighten it. For whom do I live now, Agnes, if it is not for you? Oh, spare me! I am not myself. Another time was all I could distinguish. Was it a selfish error that was leading me away, or, having once a clue to hope, was there something opening to me that I had not dared to think of? I must say more. I cannot let you leave me so. For heaven's sake, Agnes, let us not mistake each other after all these years, and all that has come and gone with them. I must speak plainly. If you have any lingering thought that I could envy the happiness you will confer, that I could not resign you to a dearer protector of your own choosing, that I could not, from my removed place, be a contented witness of your joy, dismiss it, for I don't deserve it. I have not suffered quite in vain. You have not taught me quite in vain. There is no alloy of self in what I feel for you. She was quiet now. In a little time she turned her pale face towards me and said in a low voice, broken here and there, but very clear, I owe it to your pure friendship for me, Trotwood, which, indeed, I do not doubt, to tell you you are mistaken. I can do no more. If I have sometimes in the course of years wanted help and counsel, they have come to me. If I have sometimes been unhappy, the feeling has passed away. If I have ever had a burden on my heart, it has been lightened for me. If I have any secret, it is no new one. It is not what you suppose. I cannot reveal it or divide it. It has long been mine and must remain mine. Agnes, stay a moment. She was going away, but I detained her. I clasped my arm about her waist. In the course of years, it is not a new one. New thoughts and hopes were whirling through my mind, and all the colours of my life were changing. Dearest Agnes, whom I so respect and honour, whom I so devotedly love, when I came here today I thought that nothing could have wrested this confession from me. I thought I could have kept it in my bosom all our lives till we were old. But Agnes, if I have indeed any new-born hope that I may ever call you something more than sister, widely different from sister. Her tears fell fast, but they were not like those she had lately shed, and I saw my hope brighten in them. Agnes, ever my guide and best support, if you had been more mindful of yourself and less of me when we grew up here together, I think my heedless fancy never would have wandered from you, but you were so much better than I, so necessary to me in every boyish hope and disappointment, that to have you to confide in and rely upon in everything became a second nature, supplanting for the time the first and greater one of loving you as I do. Still weeping, but not sadly, joyfully, and clasped in my arms as she had never been, and as I thought she never was to be. When I loved Dora, fondly, Agnes, as you know. Yes, she cried earnestly, I am glad to know it. When I loved her, even then, my love would have been incomplete without your sympathy. I had it, and it was perfected, and when I lost her, Agnes, what should I have been without you still? Closer in my arms, nearer to my heart, her trembling hand upon my shoulder, her sweet eyes shining through her tears on mine. I went away, dear Agnes, loving you. I stayed away, loving you. I returned home, loving you. And now I tried to tell her of the struggle I had had, and the conclusion I had come to. I tried to lay my mind before her, truly and entirely. I tried to show her how I had hoped I had come to the better knowledge of myself and of her and how I had resigned myself to what that better knowledge brought, and how I had come there, even that day, in my fidelity to this. If she did so love me, I said, that she could take me for her husband, and she could do so on no deserving of mine, except upon the truth of my love for her, and the trouble in which it had repined to be what it was, and hence it was that I revealed it. And, oh, Agnes, even out of thy true eyes in that same time, the spirit of my child-wife looked upon me, saying it was well, and winning me through thee, to tenderest recollections of the blossom that had withered in its bloom. I am so blessed, Trotwood, my heart is so overcharged, but there is one thing I must say. Dearest, what? She laid her gentle hands upon my shoulders and looked calmly in my face. Do you know yet what it is? 
I am afraid to speculate on what it is. Tell me, my dear. I have loved you all my life. Oh, we were happy. We were happy. Our tears were not for the trials, hers so much the greater, through which we had come to be thus, but for the rapture of being thus, never to be divided more. We walked that winter evening in the fields together, and the blessed calm within us seemed to be partaken by the frosty air. The early stars began to shine while we were lingering on, and looking up to them we thanked our God for having guided us to this tranquillity. We stood together in the same old-fashioned window at night, when the moon was shining, Agnes with her quiet eyes raised up to it, I following her glance. Long miles of road then opened out before my mind, and toiling on I saw a ragged, wayworn boy, forsaken and neglected, who should come to call even the heart now beating against mine his own. It was nearly dinner-time next day when we appeared before my aunt. She was up in my study, Peggotty said, which it was her pride to keep in readiness and order for me. We found her in her spectacle, sitting by the fire. Goodness me! said my aunt, peering through the dusk. "'Who's this you're bringing home?' "'Agnes,' said I. As we had arranged to say nothing at first, my aunt was not a little discomfited. She darted a hopeful glance at me when I said Agnes, but seeing that I looked as usual, she took off her spectacles in despair and rubbed her nose with them. She greeted Agnes heartily, nevertheless, and we were soon in the lighted parlour downstairs at dinner. My aunt put on her spectacles twice or thrice to take another look at me, but as often took them off again disappointed, and rubbed her nose with them, much to the discomfiture of Mr. Dick, who knew this to be a bad symptom. "'By the by, aunt,' said I after dinner, "'I have been speaking to Agnes about what you told me.' "'Then, Trot,' said my aunt, turning scarlet, "'you did wrong and broke your promise.' "'You are not angry, aunt, I trust.' I am sure you won't be when you learn that Agnes is not unhappy in any attachment. Stuff and nonsense, said my aunt. As my aunt appeared to be annoyed, I thought the best way was to cut her annoyance short. I took Agnes in my arm to the back of her chair, and we both leaned over her. My aunt, with one clap of her hands and one look through her spectacles, immediately went into hysterics for the first and only time in all my knowledge of her. The hysterics called up Peggotty. The moment my aunt was restored, she flew at Peggotty, and, calling her a silly old creature, hugged her with all her might. After that, she hugged Mr. Dick, who was highly honoured, but a good deal surprised, and after that told him why. Then we were all happy together. I could not discover whether my aunt, in her last short conversation with me, had fallen on a pious fraud, or had really mistaken the state of my mind. It was quite enough, she said, that she had told me Agnes was going to be married, and that now I knew better than anyone how true it was. We were married within a fortnight. Traddles and Sophie and Dr. and Mrs. Strong were the only guests at our quiet wedding. We left them full of joy and drove away together. Clasped in my embrace, I held the source of every worthy aspiration I had ever had, the centre of myself, the circle of my life, my own, my wife my love for whom was founded on a rock. "'Dearest husband,' said Agnes, "'now that I may call you by that name, I have one thing more to tell you. Let me hear it, love. It grows out of the night when Dora died. She sent you for me.' "'She did. She told me that she left me something. Can you think what it was?' "'I believed I could. I drew the wife who had so long loved me closer to my side.' She told me that she made a last request to me, and left me a last charge. And it was, that only I would occupy this vacant place. Agnes laid her head upon my breast, and wept, and I wept with her, though we were so happy. End of chapter 62
I had advanced in fame and fortune, my domestic joy was perfect, I had been married ten happy years. Agnes and I were sitting by the fire in our house in London one night in spring, and three of our children were playing in the same room, when I was told that a stranger wished to see me. He had been asked if he came on business, and had answered no, that he had come for the pleasure of seeing me, and had come a long way. He was an old man, my servant said, and looked like a farmer. As this sounded mysterious to the children, and moreover was like the beginning of a favourite story Agnes used to tell them, introductory to the arrival of a wicked old fairy in a cloak who hated everybody, it produced some commotion. One of our boys laid his head on his mother's lap to be out of harm's way, and little Agnes, our eldest child, left a doll in a chair to represent her, and thrust out her little heap of golden curls from between the window curtains to see what happened next. "'Let him come in here,' said I. There soon appeared, pausing in the dark doorway as he entered, a hale, grey-haired old man. Little Agnes, attracted by his looks, had run to bring him in, and I had not yet clearly seen his face, when my wife, starting up, cried out to me in a pleased and agitated voice that it was Mr. Peggotty. It was Mr. Peggotty, an old man now, but in a ruddy, hearty, strong old age. When our first emotion was over, and he sat before the fire with the children on his knees, and a blaze shining on his face, he looked to me as vigorous and robust, with all as handsome, an old man as ever I had seen. "'Master Davy,' he said, and the old name in the old tone fell so naturally on my ear. "'Master Davy, tis a joyful hour as I see you once more, long with your own true wife.' "'A joyful hour indeed, old friend.' cried I. "'And these here pretty ones,' said Mr. Peggotty, "'to look at these here flowers. Why, Master Davy, you was but the height of the littlest of these when I first see you, when Emily warn't no bigger, and our poor lad were but a lad.' "'Time has changed me more than it has changed you since then,' said I. "'But let these dear rogues go to bed, and as no house in England but this must hold you, tell me where to send for your luggage. Is the old black bag among it?' that went so far, I wonder. And then, over a glass of Yarmouth grog, we will have the tidings of ten years. "'Are you alone?' asked Agnes. "'Yes, ma'am,' he said, kissing her hand. "'Quite alone.' We sat him between us, not knowing how to give him welcome enough, and as I began to listen to his old familiar voice, I could have fancied he was still pursuing his long journey in search of his darling niece. "'It's a mort of water,' said Mr. Peggotty, "'for to come across and only stay a matter of four weeks. "'But water, especially when tis salt, comes natural to me, "'and friends is dear, and I am here.' "'Which is verse,' said Mr. Peggotty, surprised to find it out, "'though I hadn't such intentions. "'Are you going back those many thousand miles so soon?' asked Agnes. "'Yes, ma'am.' he returned. I give the promise to Emily afore I come away. You see, I do not grow younger as the years comes round, and if I hadn't sailed as twas, most likely I should not never have done it. And it's all that's been on my mind as I must come and see Master Davy and your own sweet bloomin' self in your wedded happiness afore I got to be too old. He looked at us as if he could never feast his eyes on us sufficiently. Agnes laughingly put back some scattered locks of his grey hair that he might see us better. "'And now tell us,' said I, "'everything relating to your fortunes.' "'Our fortunes, Master Davy,' he rejoined, "'is soon told. "'We haven't fared no house but fared to thrive. "'We've all us thrived. "'We've worked as we ought to, "'and maybe we lived a little hard at first or so, "'but we all us thrived. "'What with sheep farming, and what with stock farming, "'and what with one thing, and what with t'other, we are as well to do as well could be. There's been kinder a blessing fell upon us, said Mr. Peggotty, reverentially inclining his head, and we've done nought but prosper. That is, in the long run. If not yesterday, why then today? If not today, why then tomorrow? And Emily, said Agnes and I both together. Emily, said he, arter you left her, ma'am, and I never heard her saying of her prayers at night to her side of the canvas screen when we was settled in the bush, but what I heard your name, and arter she and me lost sight of Master Davy that there shining sundown, was that low at first that if she had known then what Master Davy kept from us so kind and thoughtful, tis my opinion she'd have drooped away. But there were some poor folks aboard as had illness among em, and she took care of em. 
and there was children in our company and she took care of them and so she got to be busy and to be doing good and that helped her when did she first hear of it i asked i kept it from her after i heard on it said mr peggotty going on nigh a year we was living then in a solitary place but among the beautifulest trees and with the roses a covering our being to the roof there come along one day when i was out a working on the land a traveller from our own norfolk or suffolk in england i don't really know which and of course we took him in and give him to eat and drink and made him welcome we all do that all the colony over he got an old newspaper with him and some other account in print of the storm that's how she'd knowed it when i came home at night i found she'd knowed it he dropped his voice as he said these words, and the gravity I so well remembered overspread his face. Did it change her much? we asked. Ah, for a good long time, he said, shaking his head, if not to this present hour. But I think the solitude done her good, and she had a deal to mind in the way of poultry and the like, and minded of it, and come through. I wonder, he said thoughtfully, if you could see my Emily now, Master Davy, whether you'd know her. Is she so altered? I inquired. I do it know. I see her every day and do it know. But odd times I have thought so. A slight figure, said Mr. Peggotty, looking at the fire. Kind of worn, soft, sorrowful, blue eyes. A delicate face, a pretty head leaning a little down. A quiet voice and way, timid almost. That's Emily. We silently observed him as he sat, still looking at the fire. Some thinks, he said, as her affection was ill bestowed, some as her marriage was broken off by death. No one knows how tis. She might have married well and more to times, but uncle, she says to me, that's gone for ever. Cheerful along with me, retired when others is by, fond of going any distance for to teach a child or for to tend a sick person, or for to do some kindness towards a young girl's wedding, and she's done a many, but she has never seen one, fondly loving of her uncle, patient, liked by young and old, sought out by all that has any trouble. That's Emily. He drew his hand across his face, and with a half-suppressed sigh looked up from the fire. Is Martha with you yet? I asked. Martha, he replied, got married, Master Davy, in the second year. A young man, a farm labourer, has come by us on his way to market with his master's drays, a journey of over five hundred miles there and back, made offers for to take her for his wife. Wives is very scarce there, and then to set up for their two selves in the bush. She spoke to me for to tell him her true story. I did. They was married, and they lived four hundred miles away from any voices but their own and the singing birds. "'Mrs. Gummidge,' I suggested. It was a pleasant key to touch, for Mr. Peggotty suddenly burst into a roar of laughter and rubbed his hands up and down his legs as he had been accustomed to do when he enjoyed himself in a long, shipwrecked boat. "'Would you believe it?' he said. "'Why, someone even made offer for to marry her. "'If a ship's cook that was turning settler, Master Davy, "'didn't make offers for to marry Mrs. Gummidge, "'I'm, I'm dormed, and I can't say no fairer than that.' I never saw Agnes laugh so. This sudden ecstasy on the part of Mr. Peggotty was so delightful to her that she could not leave off laughing, and the more she laughed, the more she made me laugh, and the greater Mr. Peggotty's ecstasy became, and the more he rubbed his legs. And what did Mrs. Gummidge say, I asked, when I was grave enough? If you'll believe me, returned Mr. Peggotty, Mrs. Gummidge, instead of saying thank you and much obliged to you, I ain't a going for to change my condition at my time of life, up with a bucket that was standing by and laid it over that dear ship's cook's head till he sung out for help and I went in and rescued of him. Mr. Peggotty burst into a great roar of laughter and Agnes and I both kept him company. But I must say this for a good creature, he resumed, wiping his face when we were quite exhausted. She has been all she said she'd be to us and more. She's the willingest, the truest, the honestest helping woman, Master Davy, as ever drew the bread of life. I have never knowed her to be lone and lorn for a single minute, not even when the colony was all afore us and we was new to it. And thinking of the old one is a thing she'd never done, I do assure you, since she left England. Now, last not least, Mr. Micawber, said I. He has paid off every obligation he incurred here, even to Traddles's bill, you remember, my dear Agnes, and therefore we may take it for granted that he is doing well. But what is the latest news of him? 
Mr. Peggotty, with a smile, put his hand in his breast pocket and produced a flat-folded paper parcel, from which he took out with much care a little odd-looking newspaper. "'You are to understand, Master Davy,' he said, "'as we have left the bush now, being so well to do, and have gone right way round to Port Middle Bay Harbour, where there's what we call a town.' Uh, "'Mr. Micawber was in the bush near you,' said I. Oh, "'Bless you, yes,' said Mr. Peggotty, "'and turned to with a will.' I never wish to meet a greater gentleman for turning to with a will. I've seen that there bald head of his a perspiring in the sun, Master Davy, till I almost thought it would have melted away. And now he's a magistrate. A magistrate, eh? said I. Mr. Peggotty pointed to a certain paragraph in the newspaper where I read aloud as followed from the Port Middle Bay Times. The public dinner to our distinguished fellow colonist and townsman, Wilkins Micawber, Esquire, Port Middle Bay District Magistrate, came off yesterday in the large room of the hotel, which was crowded to suffocation. It is estimated that not fewer than forty-seven persons must have been accommodated with dinner at one time, exclusive of the company in the passage and on the stairs. The beauty, fashion, and exclusiveness of Port Middle Bay flocked to do honour to one so deservedly esteemed, so highly talented, and so widely popular. Dr. Mell of Colonial Salem House Grammar School, Port Middle Bay, presided, and on his right sat the distinguished guest. After the removal of the cloth and the singing of Non Nobis, beautifully executed, and in which we were at no loss to distinguish the bell-like notes of that gifted amateur, Wilkins Micawber, Esquire, Jr., the usual loyal and patriotic toasts were severally given and rapturously received. Dr. Mell, in a speech replete with feeling, then proposed our distinguished guest, the ornament of our town. May he never leave us but to better himself, and may his success among us be such as to render his bettering himself impossible. The cheering with which the toast was received defies description. Again and again it rose and fell like the waves of ocean. At length all was hushed, and Wilkins Micawber, Esquire, presented himself to return thanks. Far be it from us, in the present comparatively imperfect state of the resources of our establishment, to endeavour to follow our distinguished townsman through the smoothly flowing periods of his polished and highly ornate address. Suffice it to observe that it was a masterpiece of eloquence, and that those passages in which he more particularly traced his own successful career to its source, and warned the younger portion of his auditory from the shoals of ever incurring pecuniary liabilities which they were unable to liquidate, brought a tear into the manliest eye present. The remaining toasts were Dr. Mell, Mrs. Micawber, who gracefully bowed her acknowledgments from the side door, where a galaxy of beauty was elevated on chairs, at once to witness and adore the gratifying scene. Mrs. Bridger Beggs, late Miss Micawber, Mrs. Mell, Wilkins Micawber, Esquire, Jr., who convulsed the assembly by humorously remarking that he found himself unable to return thanks in speech, but would do so, with their permission, in a song. Mrs. Micawber's family, well known, it is needless to remark, in the mother country, etc., etc., etc. At the conclusion of the proceedings, the tables were cleared as if by art magic for dancing. Among the votaries of Terpsichore, who disported themselves until Sol gave warning for departure, Wilkins Micawber, Esquire, Jr., and the lovely and accomplished Miss Helena, fourth daughter of Dr. Mell, were particularly remarkable. I was looking back to the name of Dr. Mell, pleased to have discovered in these happier circumstances Mr. Mell, formerly poor pinched usher to my Middlesex magistrate, when Mr. Peggotty, pointing to another part of the paper, my eyes rested on my own name, and I read thus. To David Copperfield, Esquire, the eminent author. My dear sir, years have elapsed since I have had an opportunity of ocularly perusing the lineaments now familiar to the imaginations of a considerable portion of the civilized world. But, my dear sir, though estranged by the force of circumstances over which I have had no control, from the personal society of the friend and companion of my youth, I have not been unmindful of his soaring flight, nor have I been debarred, though seas between us braid her roared. Burns, from participating in the intellectual feasts he has spread before us. I cannot, therefore, allow of the departure from this place of an individual whom we mutually respect and esteem, without, my dear sir, taking this public opportunity of thanking you on my own behalf, and, I may undertake to add, on that of the whole of the inhabitants of Port Middlebay, for the gratification of which, 
you are the ministering agent. Go on, my dear sir, you are not unknown here, you are not unappreciated. Though remote, we are neither unfriended, melancholy, nor, I may add, slow. Go on, my dear sir, in your eagle course. The inhabitants of Port Middle Bay may at least aspire to watch it with delight, with entertainment, with instruction. Among the eyes elevated towards you from this portion of the globe will ever be found, while it has light and life, the eye appertaining to Wilkins Micawber. Magistrate. I found on glancing at the remaining content of the newspaper that Mr. Micawber was a diligent and esteemed correspondent of that journal. There was another letter from him in the same paper, touching a bridge. There was an advertisement of a collection of similar letters by him, to be shortly republished in a neat volume, with considerable additions, and, unless I am very much mistaken, the leading article was also his. We talked much of Mr. Micawber on many other evenings while Mr. Peggotty remained with us. He lived with us during the whole term of his stay, which I think was something less than a month, and his sister and my aunt came to London to see him. Agnes and I parted from him aboard ship when he sailed, and we shall never part from him more on earth. But before he left he went with me to Yarmouth to see a little tablet I had put up in the churchyard to the memory of Ham. While I was copying the plain inscription for him at his request, I saw him stoop and gather a tuft of grass from the grave and a little earth. For Emily, he said, as he put it in his breast, I promised Master Davy. End of chapter 63《Chapter 64 of David Copperfield》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tyg Hines David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Chapter 64 A Last Retrospect And now my written story ends. I look back once more for the last time before I close these leaves. I see myself with Agnes at my side, journeying along the road of life. I see our children and our friends around us, and I hear the roar of many voices, not indifferent to me as I travel on. What faces are the most distinct to me in the fleeting crowd? Lo, these, all turning to me as I ask my thoughts the question. Here is my aunt in stronger spectacles, an old woman of fourscore years and more, but upright yet, and a steady walker of six miles at a stretch in winter weather. Always with her, here comes Peggotty, my good old nurse, likewise in spectacles, accustomed to do needlework at night very close to the lamp, but never sitting down to do it without a bit of wax candle, a yard measure in a little house, and a workbox with a picture of St. Paul's upon the lid. The cheeks and arms of Peggotty, so hard and red in my childish days, when I wondered why the birds didn't peck her in preference to apples, are shriveled now and her eyes that used to darken their whole neighbourhood in her face are fainter, though they glitter still. But her rough forefinger, which I once associated with a pocket nutmeg grater, is just the same, and when I see my least child catching at it as it totters from my aunt to her, I think of our little parlour at home, when I could scarcely walk. My aunt's old disappointment is set right now. She is godmother to a real living Betsy Trotwood, and Dora, the next in order, says she spoils her. There is something bulky in Peggotty's pocket. It is nothing smaller than the crocodile book, which is in rather a dilapidated condition by this time, with divers of the leaves torn and stitched across, but which Peggotty exhibits to the children as a precious relic. I find it very curious to see my own infant face looking up at me from the crocodile stories, and to be reminded by it of my old acquaintance Brooks of Sheffield. Among my boys this summer holiday time I see an old man making giant kites, and gazing at them in the air with a delight for which there are no words. He greets me rapturously, and whispers with many nods and winks, but Trotwood, you will be glad to hear that I shall finish the memorial when I have nothing else to do, and that your aunt's the most extraordinary woman in the world, sir. Who is this bent lady, supporting herself by a stick, and showing me a countenance in which there are some traces of old pride and beauty, feebly contending with a querulous, imbecile, fretful wandering of the mind? She is in a garden, and near her stands a sharp, dark, withered woman, with a white scar upon her lip. Let me hear what they say. Rosa, I have forgotten this gentleman's name. 
Rosa bends over her and calls to her, Mr. Copperfield. I am glad to see you, sir. I am so sorry to observe you are in mourning. I hope time will be good to you. Her impatient attendant scolds her, tells her I am not in mourning, bids her look again, tries to rouse her. You have seen my son, sir, says the older woman. Are you reconciled? Looking fixedly at me, she puts her hand to her forehead and moans. Suddenly she cries in a terrible voice, oh, Rosa, come to me. He is dead. Rosa, kneeling at her feet, by turns caresses her and quarrels with her, now fiercely telling her, I loved him better than you ever did, now soothing her to sleep on her breast like a sick child. Thus I leave them, thus I always find them, thus they wear their time away from year to year. What ship comes sailing home from India, and what English lady is this, married to a growling old Scotch creosus with great flaps of ears? Can this be Julia Mills? Indeed it is Julia Mills, peevish and fine, with a black man to carry cards and letters to her on a golden salver, and a copper-coloured woman in linen, with a bright handkerchief round her head, to serve her tiffin in her dressing-room. But Julia keeps no diary in these days, never sings affection's dirge, eternally quarrels with the old Scotch Creosus, who is a sort of yellow bear with a tanned hide. Julia is steeped in money to the throat, and talks and thinks of nothing else. I liked her better in the desert of Sahara. Or perhaps this is the desert of Sahara, for though Julia has a stately house and mighty company and sumptuous dinners every day, I see no green growth near her, nothing that can ever come to fruit or flower. What Julia calls society I see, among it Mr. Jack Malden from his patent place sneering at the hand that gave it to him, and speaking to me of the doctor as so charmingly antique. But when society is the name for such hollow gentlemen and ladies, Julia, and when its breeding is professed indifference to everything that can advance or can retard mankind, I think we must have lost ourselves in that same desert of Sahara, and had better find the way out. And lo, the doctor, always our good friend, labouring at his dictionary, somewhere about the letter D, and happy in his home and wife, also the old soldier on a considerably reduced footing, and by no means so influential as in days of yore. Working at his chambers in the temple, with a busy aspect, and his hair, where he is not bald, made more rebellious than ever by the constant friction of his lawyer's wig, I come in a later time upon my old dear Traddles. His table is covered with thick piles of papers, and I say, as I look around me, If Sophie were your clerk now, Traddles, she would have enough to do. You may say that, my dear Copperfield, but those were capital days, too, in Holborn Court, were they not? When she told you you would be a judge, but it was not the town talk then. At all events, said Traddles, if I ever am one, why, you know you will be. Well, my dear Copperfield, when I am one, I shall tell the story as I said I would. We walk away arm in arm. I am going to have a family dinner with Traddles. It is Sophie's birthday, and on our road Traddles discourses to me of the good fortune he has enjoyed. I really have been able, my dear Copperfield, to do all that I had most at heart. There's the Reverend Horace promoted to that living at four hundred and fifty pounds a year. There are our two boys receiving the very best education and distinguishing themselves as steady scholars and good fellows. There are three of the girls married very comfortably. There are three more living with us, and there are three more keeping house for the Reverend Horace since Mrs. Crewler's decease, and all of them happy. Except, I suggest, except the beauty, said Traddles. Yes. It was very unfortunate that she should marry such a vagabond, but there was a certain dash and blur about him that caught her. However, now we have got her safe at our house and got rid of him, we must cheer her up again. Traddles' house is one of the very houses, or it easily may have been, which he and Sophie used to parcel out in their evening walks. It is a large house, but Traddles keeps his papers in his dressing room and his boots with his papers, and he and Sophie squeeze themselves into upper rooms, reserving the best bedrooms for the beauty and the girls. There is no room to spare in the house, for more of the girls are here, and always are here, by some accident or other, than I know how to count. Here, when we go in, is a crowd of them running down to the door and handing Traddles about to be kissed until he is out of breath. 
Here, established in perpetuity, is the poor beauty, a widow with a little girl. Here at dinner on Sophie's birthday are the three married girls with their three husbands, and one of the husband's brothers, and another husband's cousin, and another husband's sister, who appears to me to be engaged to the cousin. Traddles, exactly the same simple, unaffected fellow as ever he was, sits at the foot of the large table like a patriarch, and Sophie beams upon him from the head, across a cheerful space that is certainly not glittering with Britannia metal. And now, as I close my task, subduing my desire to linger yet, these faces fade away. But one face, shining on me like a heavenly light by which I see all other objects, is above them and beyond them all. And that remains. I turn my head and see it in its beautiful serenity beside me. My lamp burns low, and I have written far into the night, but the dear presence, without which I were nothing, bears me company. O oh, Agnes, O oh, my soul, so may thy face be by me when I close my life indeed. So may I, when realities are melting from me, like the shadows which I now dismiss, still find thee near me, pointing upward. End of chapter 64 That is the end of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Read by Tyg Hines